Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Iraqi Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host Juma Iraqi and joining me today is Kamal Patel. Kamal, how are you doing? Hello, hello. How are you doing, Kamal? (laughs) I'm doing good. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Thank you so much for agreeing to do another podcast. We did one earlier on fructose, but today we're going to talk a bit about vitamin D and I know this is a topic that you're really interested in and done some done some research on it as well. Yeah, vitamin D is always a hot topic, um, and you know it's it's probably the hottest vitamin and mineral of the past ten years. So it's fun to talk about. Excellent. So for people that haven't uh, viewed uh, or listened to our um, podcast on uh, fructose, could you give us a brief introduction about yourself? Sure. So I'm a nutrition researcher. I run the website examine.com um, and examine.com is sort of the internet's um, compendium of supplements and nutrient research. So uh, we just look at the primary research and we synthesize it and interpret it for people who read the website and everything on the website is free um, and we don't sell any supplements. Um, we just sell some additional information so that we can pay the bills. Um, and as a nutrition researcher, I used to be, um, you know, interested personally for sports supplementation uh, as I was a wannabe powerlifter. Um, and I guess that was maybe around 20 years ago. And then uh, more recently, it's been in terms of health. I guess, you know, as everybody gets older, they're more interested in their health and their children's health and whatnot. Um, so that's that's what I do. I read studies all day long. Excellent. And uh, I have to say, examine.com has been a... Uh, a great great website i re- recommend it to all my colleagues and all my my students it's such a great resource to use on on um, supplementation uh on on one end but also if you have like you've covered a lot of questions for example on popular supplements and 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 side effects and concerns that people have for example on creatine you've i think you've written an article or or um, a section on uh, boldness by using creatine? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the questions on creatine are often um, having to do with hair loss, having to do with um, different forms, and having to do with cognitive benefits. And and those are the things we tend to write about. Excellent. All right, so let's uh, jump into today's uh, topic. That's vitamin D. And uh, for people that... um, don't know this this podcast is available on itunes in audio format but if you want to watch watch the video as well you can find that on on youtube so kamal could you start explaining what uh, vitamin d is and what what function it has in the body sure so um everybody knows vitamin d as the the sun sun, sunshine sunlight vitamin sun vitamin um But it's best to think about it not in terms of the other vitamins and minerals. So vitamin D is not a steroid. Sometimes, you know, in the media you're, oh, vitamin D is actually a steroid, not a vitamin. So that's not quite true. Um, Starting from the beginning, vitamin D is a fat-soluble compound. So the other fat-soluble vitamins are vitamin A, vitamin E, and vitamin K. Um, And because it's fat soluble, it means when you consume it in supplemental form at least, then you need to consume it with some fat. Uh, But it's actually a bit different than some of the other fat soluble vitamins, uh, meaning A, K, and E. So with vitamin A, for example, if you eat a very high fat meal, like like let's say 30 grams of fat um, versus eating vitamin A or taking the pill with five grams of fat, the 30 grams of fat is gonna lead to much, much, much higher absorption. But with vitamin D, if you take that 30 grams of fat versus five grams, five grams will actually be absorbed better. So not all fat soluble vitamins are the same. Vitamin D is one where it's best absorbed with some amount of fat, but not a ton of fat. So um, I guess the lowest hanging fruit is if you take vitamin D in the morning with your coffee, then that's not good. At least take it with some food. So vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin um, and it turns into a steroid later on. So it's really a pre-hormone or a pro-hormone. 
Um, and, and if you buy the supplement at a store, then you'll see either vitamin D3 or vitamin D2. So um, like every other food or every other supplement, it, it somehow could usually be traced back to an animal or a plant. And in this case, the D3 is traced back to animals and the D2 to plants, but not really in the way that you think. So D3 is synthesized by any animal. Um, you have to have D3 if you're a mammal, like even cats um, in the winter. So I like cats a lot. So I remember when uh, when I had a cat once and it would it would kind of like sit in the window and just look outside all winter long. So I thought, oh, is it is it wanting to get sunshine? Is it vitamin D deficient? Uh, I guess that's not quite true because a lot of mammals are very efficient in producing vitamin D. I wonder if it's something to do with animals that have a lot of fur. So you have to be more efficient. But um, animals with fur, with wool or whatever, make vitamin D after exposure to sunlight or light um, or, or different types of UV light. And they keep it in their oil around their fur. So the way that we get vitamin D3 and supplemental form, I think it's often through like uh, – the wool in sheeps, and then they extract it from the oil around the wool or something like that. Uh, in contrast, vitamin D2 is made by yeast. Um, so I think they make it naturally, but when we cultivate it to make supplemental vitamin D2, then basically um, they force radiation into yeast. The yeast make large amounts of vitamin D, and then we can that into pills. So um, that's D2 versus D3. The only other way to get vitamin D through plants really is through mushrooms. Um, and the normal mushroom, like the white mushroom or the brown or portobello mushroom, doesn't really have much vitamin D, you know, maybe like 1% or something. Um, so it's really like kind of weird mushroom types that you wouldn't encounter unless you're a mushroom aficionado going through a forest. So uh, D2 and D3 are the main forms of vitamin D. Um, and, you know, we recommend... And a lot of doctors recommend to get vitamin D3 if you're going to supplement. So it, it's kind of weird because vitamin D2 used to be prescribed a lot. Um, and I think it might just be a historical artifact because vitamin D2, um, you know, is is from irradiated plants. Um, and then it was maybe one of the first studied forms of vitamin D. So D2 is not as good as D3 because when vitamin D floats around in the blood, it's bound to something and vitamin D2 doesn't bind as well to that protein as vitamin D3 does. So it's probably no big deal. You know, if you get a prescription for vitamin D2 and you take D2, um, you're going to raise your vitamin D levels in your blood. But uh, there's, well, as we're talking, you'll find that there's a lot of things that haven't been studied about vitamin D. So even though there's so much research on vitamin D and the past five or 10 years, you know, more and more papers every year, there are some things we don't know. Like we know that vitamin D2 can raise vitamin D levels in the blood, uh, maybe not as well as D3, but plenty enough. But what happens if you have vitamin D that is not bound to this protein because vitamin D2 doesn't bind as well? That might not be as great. So we'll talk later about potential toxicity from vitamin D. So there's a theoretical reason even to take D3 over D2, which is that it binds better. Um, so those are, that's D2 versus D3, but the whole steroid thing is once you either take vitamin D or you produce it in your skin from sunlight exposure from UVB, then there's three terms that everybody should know. Well, not everybody, but people listen to the podcast because they're into nutrition. So, uh, there's D3, um, and D2. So those are calciferols. Um, those are the initial form of vitamin D, and that's basically a product of cholesterol. You have a cholesterol molecule. There is a form of cholesterol under your skin. Uh, that UVB light hits the skin, and then that cholesterol sort of thing converts to vitamin D3. So then the vitamin D3 goes to the liver, and then it is turned into 25-OH vitamin D, also known as 25-hydroxy vitamin D. So um, that's that form that the doctor tests for. So if you say, oh, my vitamin D levels are low, it means your 25 OHD is low. It doesn't mean your vitamin D3 is low. It doesn't mean that the eventual steroid is low. It means 25 OH specifically is low. Mm -hmm. So the reason that doctors measure that 25 OHD is that's the vitamin D that's bound to that protein in your blood. So that vitamin D is always in our blood. It crosses into our cells. It's everywhere. So it's ubiquitous. So that 25 OHD can tell us how much 
vitamin D we have in our body. But that's not really the vitamin D that's usually used by cells. Um, so the vitamin D that's often used by cells is 125D. So um, that 125D or calcitriol is a very active hormone. Um, the thing is that it stays within the cell. So that 25-OHD from before can cross in and out of cells. It can go wherever it wants to. It's in a lot of our tissues. But the 125D, because it's such a powerful hormone, it stays within the cell. And it also means that every cell can fine tune their vitamin D level according to how much of the 125D they want to make because they make it out of that 25-OHD. So the best way to think about it is that the 25 OHD is sort of the form that's everywhere and the form that's stored. The 125 D is the very active form, like 500 or 1,000 times more active. And that's the one that the cell uses specifically. So if the cell needs more vitamin D, it'll convert more of the 25 OHD into the 125. And if it needs less, it'll convert less of it. So 25 OHD is the one that the, the doctor will test for. Cells fine-tuned to 125D or, yeah, 125 um, OHD, but both of them can be active. Even though the 125 is much more active, the 25 is also active, but just a lot less so. Um, so when thinking about vitamin D, think about D2 versus D3, you know, almost always take D3, and then think about the three forms of vitamin D. That D2, D3, which is the initial one, the 25D, which the liver makes, and then the 125D, which the kidney makes. Excellent. Now, uh, a question that often people ask when we're talking about vitamin D2 and D3 is, was there ever a vitamin D1? You know, I don't actually know that. Um, you know, I'm going to note that down mm. and, and look into that for next time I talk to you. But I, I don't know. I've never heard of a vitamin D1, so who knows? Okay. Now, uh could we touch more about what vitamin D is important for in the body? Sure. So vitamin D is currently known as the bone vitamin, um, but that's that wasn't always the case. So um, if you look back at the history of vitamin D, vitamin D wasn't always a good thing um, because uh, vitamin D can be very powerful because it eventually converts to hormone. But if you think about other vitamins that are associated with hormones, like vitamin A um, and vitamin D are both vitamins that can affect how genes make proteins, you know, so they affect hormones, basically. Um, so anytime you can affect genes making proteins, it could be good, you know, if you have optimal levels, or it could be bad if you have too little or too much. So there was a time, I don't know if it was the 20s or 1930s or something, when vitamin D was seen as bad because it could be really toxic. Um, and the way it's toxic is um, there's only really a couple ways to get too much vitamin D. You can't get too much vitamin D from the sun uh, because after a certain point, uh, usually a max of about 20,000 I use, um, the vitamin D is essentially destroyed. So you're capped off at how much vitamin D you can make. And in addition, you start synthesizing less vitamin D the more often you get sun exposure. So you basically don't have to worry about getting too much vitamin D from the sun. But you can get too much vitamin D from supplements. And you can get too much vitamin D if you eat very, very specific animal products. So vitamin D wasn't always a good thing, but now it's seen as good because it's important for bone health. Um, but it's possibly more important for things like immune health and also there's this big category of things we don't really know about and that includes cancer and heart disease. So um, if I had to say, uh, you know, if you're talking to your friends or family about vitamin D, then the first thing you would want to do is think about if you have any, you know, women in your life, older women, and are they taking calcium supplements? So if you're taking a calcium supplement and you're a postmenopausal woman, then basically taking a moderate to high amount of calcium could be the worst thing you're doing for your health. Um, and that's because arterial calcification, so getting excess calcium in your artery, um, is a much better predictor of if you're going to have heart disease and heart attack than any individual cholesterol measurement. So, 
you know, cardiologists will get a coronary calcium score because it's so well correlated to heart attacks and dying from heart attacks. And one way to get too much calcium in your artery is by eating too much calcium. So it's hard to eat too much calcium from plants and animals because a lot of the plant sources of calcium also have calcium absorption inhibitors. Um, and it's hard to get too much calcium from animals because most people don't eat a lot of bones. You know, even if you like drink a lot of bone broth, um, it doesn't have that much calcium in it. You really have to like eat a lot of soft bones, like from, you know, canned fish or whatever, um, or take a lot of supplements. And a lot of older women are just taking a ton of calcium supplements because uh, they get a diagnosis of osteoporosis or osteopenia before osteoporosis and they panic. So they start taking calcium in the pill form. They get calcium in their chocolate chewy dessert type thing. They get calcium through their fortified foods. Um, and then orange juice often has calcium now. So when you add all that up, it's just too much calcium. And if there's one thing that researchers know is that there's a very reliable effect of moderate to higher calcium supplemental intake and higher risk of heart attack and death from heart attack, especially in postmenopausal women. So when those women convince them to take at least a moderate amount of vitamin D, because in order to get the calcium in the right places, that is bone mostly, um, and away from soft tissue, so arteries or joints, um, you have to have enough vitamin D and some other nutrients. So number one thing to think of is preventing people who don't know too much about nutrition from getting too much calcium. Um, and then everything else is sort of secondary. And I'd say the number one thing out of those secondary things is immune health. So um, the there's conflicting evidence about different site, sorts of like, you know, cold versus flu versus tuberculosis versus other immune related things. But if you look at some of the, the best and largest trials, like there was a trial in, uh, in a nursing home in Wisconsin a few years ago that showed that the only difference between one year and the next is that the medical director, whoever gave the um, people at the nursing home some minimum amount of vitamin D. It wasn't a huge amount, 400 IUs, 1,000, I don't remember what. But the number of flu cases went down from something like, you know, uh, 0.5% or 1% to almost zero. So that's very important because the fewer older people who get flus, not only do the fewer young people get flus from hanging around them, but if you're older or immune compromised, you can die easily from a flu. You know, much more people than a lot of other conditions. So um, it's really important to get enough vitamin D for immune health. And it's especially important to get enough vitamin D during the winter. So there's some seasonal variation not just in vitamin D because of sunlight, but there is a seasonal variation in our immune systems. So typically, you know, if you look at uh, before um, PubMed was around, then we would be outside during the summer. We would eat different sorts of foods during the summer, often more carbohydrates. So especially like in Northern Europe, um, there's a lot more carbohydrate availability during the summer than the winter you know, less so near the equator. But if you eat more carbs, you get more vitamin D in the summer and store it for the winter, then winter comes and there's more pathogens um, and pathogens are spread more easily. So you don't get a cold from being in the cold, but it makes pathogens spread more easily. So in the winter, vitamin D would do its thing. It would um, improve your immediate immune response, uh, but it also dampens the adaptive immune response. So what that means is that it's good for stopping pathogens from crossing through the intestine or through the mucous membranes. Um, but it also conversely dampens the adaptive immune response, which is the immune response that can get overactive and autoimmune conditions. So that explains both vitamin D helping colds and flus and also vitamin D potentially helping autoimmune conditions like multiple sclerosis. So basically, vitamin D is extremely important for immune health, and it's probably even more important for immune health than it is for bone health. Excellent. I just want to touch uh, on the, the thing that you mentioned about uh, calcium. You mentioned that um, elderly people that are taking a lot of uh, calcium supplements, uh, mm -hmm. and, you, and you mentioned moderate amounts. What are we talking about in amounts, if you have any numbers on that? Um, you know, it varies a lot because like my, my orange juice that the last orange juice I bought, I think it had like maybe a hundred milligrams or something. Mm -hmm. And I don't, that's not like a ton, mm -hmm. 
but it's a lot when you're adding it to, to other stuff. Um, and those chews, like in the U.S., the most popular one is a Viactive chew. I don't know if each chew has 50 or 100, but women will sometimes like eat three or four of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then the cereal here, like uh, Total or Product 19 or the ones that have a lot of vitamins and minerals, has 50% of the recommended daily allowance for calcium. Mm -hmm. So it's really a ton of different sources adding up. Um, and you don't want that variability because some people will get some of the sources and some will get all of them. And and it's weird because the people who are most into nutrition will like make sure to get a lot of sources and then that could be detrimental. Okay. Are we talking about an upper limit for the total amount that you consume during the day? Uh, there's no real upper limit, but I'd say a safe bet is don't exceed the recommended daily allowance by more than 50% you know, for any extended period of time. And what that translates to is um, there's actually not that many good sources of calcium from your diet. So like kale is a good source of calcium because it doesn't have the absorption inhibitors that like spinach does, for example. Um, and then there are some other plants that are good sources of calcium without inhibitors. And then dairy obviously is a, is a great source. Um, and it has high bioavailability as does kale. But um, if you at least get one food product that has a decent amount of calcium and you eat it somewhat regularly, not even every day, and then you, if you take vitamin D, it's okay to supplement with calcium, just not with very high amounts. Mm -hmm. So if you have some source of food, whether it's dairy or kale or whatever, and then some small to moderate amount of supplementation, as long as you have vitamin D, then that's probably safe. Okay, great. So uh, we, we talked a bit about different sources for vitamin D. Obviously, sunlight is the best source. And we have some other sources in the foods that we eat. Could you mention a couple of good sources that we have for vitamin D? Yeah. So, um, you know, the disclaimer is that no food source is nearly as good as sunlight. So the efficiency of sunlight, like if you have 20 minutes and you're trying to get vitamin D, uh, which it's kind of sad that, um, not sad and like, uh, making fun of them way, but it's sad that people have to be like, oh, I'm going out to get my vitamin D now. Cause, uh, you know, when you work in a, in a cubicle or in an office setting, you actually do have to try to get vitamin D. Like I remember when I was working on this, uh, vitamin D systematic review a few years ago, I was working in a hospital in a setting where I had to, you know, it took me five or 10 minutes to get outside going through elevators and stuff. You don't synthesize any vitamin D from sunlight going through a window. So you have to try really hard, um, which sucks. But if you can get vitamin D through sunlight, 20 minutes of sunlight will make more vitamin D than anything you can eat. But if you're getting it through diet, then in Northern Europe, historically, cod liver oil was the source of vitamin D. So, you know, there's this, um, hypothesis that skin color is due to uh, needing to get vitamin D, which sort of true, but also possibly sort of not true. So um, if you accept the out of Africa migration hypothesis, then as people went more north, um, as well as, you know, sometimes far south, then in order to get enough vitamin D, because vitamin D is involved in so many bodily processes, your skin had to get lighter. Mm -hmm. So that does make sense. But it's there's a lot of important subtleties that if we have time we'll get to later um but you know if you think about it that way that vitamin d is so important that it produced white people then it means you really have to pay attention to vitamin d because um if you don't have enough vitamin d your skeleton will not be strong enough to hold up your muscles and your skin you know you're if you don't have enough vitamin d you will catch a bug and die so it's very important and there's only very specific food sources like, you know, cod liver oil, um, small fish often, sardines, um, salmon. Uh, it bioaccumulates sometimes. So tuna, larger fish could be. Um, and then some dairy sources like milk, raw milk that is, um, or fortified um, not raw milk and sometimes eggs. Those are pretty much all the dietary sources of vitamin D if it's not being enriched, you know, artificially. So because you don't often get it through diet, um, supplementation is really popular and you know I uh, I often say like a vitamin D vacation is is a good um, option because you can store up enough vitamin D to spend um, if you take like a week or two vacation and then 
sometimes people wonder why is it that you know meat doesn't have a lot of vitamin d why is it that the seafood sources have a lot of vitamin d um and it's actually somewhat similar to the reason why seafood sources are rich sources of omega-3s so you know if you're vegan you can get omega-3s through algae and then i don't know how the ecosystem really works but plankton um eat algae or something and then fish eat plankton and it accumulates you know up the food chain but plankton also have very high amounts of vitamin d and the vitamin d2 form and then when seafood eats vitamin or plankton then they produce vitamin d3 so um they actually only have vitamin d3 seafood there is no vitamin d2 um and if you analyze their blood then they don't really have any vitamin D2. And, you know, I don't know if researchers really know why, but um, seafood is all D3. So when we eat seafood, just like we get straight up EPA and DHA for omega-3s, we get straight up converted D3. Um, and then animals, you know, on land, land mammals, they don't really have a lot of D3 because um, they're just like us. Uh, if you remember back to that 25-OH versus 125-OH, um, 125-OH is in our cells, and then we have some vitamin D 25-OH um, floating in our, in our blood. But uh, mammals concentrate their effort in that vitamin 125-D that's in our cells. So if you happen to get a lot of blood, like, uh, you know, do you guys eat blood sausage in, uh, in Scandinavian countries at all? Yeah. Blood, so blood pudding uh, stuff like that. I, I never really knew that was a thing because we were vegetarian growing up but mm -hmm. blood sausage would be a really good source of vitamin d because it's got blood mm -hmm. you know muscles don't really have a lot of blood they drain it of blood if it does have blood because it's not appetizing mm -hmm. to most people but blood sausage has blood so it means it has that vitamin d that's floating around that's bound to that vitamin d binding protein so if you eat blood sausage if you drink people's blood um, or if you drink animal blood, then you get vitamin D. But if you eat muscle meat, which most people do, you're just not getting a lot of vitamin D. So your your options are supplementing, sun, or seafood. Oh, which actually all start with S. So it's a really easy way to think about it. It's either supplementation, sun, or seafood. That's pretty much the only sources. Okay, excellent. I know this is a question that people will, will, will ask, and that's what about tanning beds? Do you produce any vitamin D if you're in a tanning bed? So that's a tricky one because um, in most tanning beds, there isn't enough UVB light to produce much vitamin D. But in some tanning beds, there are. So I don't know if they make it, you know, obvious on the tanning bed label or whatever. You know, I don't I haven't seen many tanning beds because I'm naturally tan. But I don't think you can just like see how much UVB and UVA they emit. But there was a trial in around 2011 or so on fibromyalgia patients. Mm -hmm. So fibromyalgia um, is a pain and fatigue and, you know, everything condition, which affects a lot of older women. Um, and it's a mysterious condition and it's a condition of exclusion. Uh, so, you know, people or doctors will test you for a bunch of things. Then if they don't know what it is, they'll say, oh, it's fibromyalgia. But it is a real condition because women with fibromyalgia have different levels of certain things in their blood than other people do. Mm -hmm. So fibromyalgia is a tough condition. Um, it's also classified as a pain condition, and vitamin D has been tied to fibromyalgia. So vitamin D may or may not help fibromyalgia, but um, there was a trial, a pilot trial on tanning beds that tested tanning beds that do produce UVB light in large amounts versus, you know, placebo sort of controlled tanning beds that don't. And the women who had exposure to the UVB tanning beds had significantly less pain than those in the control tanning beds, which is cool to me because um, tanning beds are basically just a concentrated source of light. And it just so happens that if you have fibromyalgia, you're much, much more likely to stay inside than other people because you're feeling fatigued, you're depressed, you don't want to you know, hang out with your friends because you don't want them to know that you're sick. So you don't get a lot of vitamin D um, and you're not outside. So if you have fibromyalgia, if you know somebody with it, if you can, you know, force yourself to go outside, then that could help. And it just so happens that uh, the research center I used to work at, this hospital in Boston, their pediatric center, their pediatric hospital used to be called the floating hospital. Um, it actually still is called that, but it's no longer floating. And what I mean by floating is that uh, sometime after the turn of the century, 
in the 1900s. Um, one of the doctors uh, thought, you know, the, when the kids are outside, then they, they're happier and they, they sort of feel better. So why don't we put the pediatric center on a boat? So you can't do that nowadays because of liability. Um, and, you know, boats aren't big enough. But back then, the pediatric center was on a boat. So it was actually floating. And children often felt better. So vitamin D wasn't, like, really well known back then. So it's most likely that vitamin D had some positive effects. Mm -hmm. Um and also getting fresh air and some other things that aren't well studied. So all combined, I'd say that um, that just being outside is is possibly important. And if you can't be outside, then tanning, as long as you can get UVB, could be a good adjunct. Excellent. Now, uh, what are symptoms you should should look at if if you when, when if you're uh, vitamin D deficient? Is there any typical things that you can notice physical on your body or or is it just by doing uh, by drawing blood so the disclaimer is that everybody should get their vitamin d tested um it's probably more important than like getting your cholesterol tested and other basic tests and it's cheap and if your doctor won't do it or if you don't want to see your doctor i think you could order it online mm -hmm. so <clears throat> that being said um, a lot of women find out that they have low vitamin D because they get a diagnosis of osteopenia or osteoporosis, so weak bones. And then they get their vitamin D tested and it's low. So before it gets to that point, you know, I wish there was a very specific way to know if you're vitamin D deficient, but it's a very generalized way. So are you getting more colds than I uh, usually do? Are you more depressed than usual during winter? Um, you know, do you have some mysterious condition that popped up out of nowhere? Is your skin rougher than usual? Do you possibly have eczema? So those are just sort of hints you might be vitamin D deficient, but there's a lot of false positives and false negatives. You could have all those things and be replete with vitamin D. You could have none of those things and be vitamin D deficient. So that's why everybody should get their vitamin D tested. Yeah, and in, in Norway, it's really not, no excuse to not get it tested because we pay like five, six dollars for for testing, uh, taking blood tests, and then you can test for a basically anything. Like you can test for yeah. anything and just pay five or six dollars for it. Yeah, I'll just show my cards here. The US is the worst healthcare system because we spend so much money per capita mm -hmm. and people have to think, oh, should I pay the $35 copay to go to my doctor and then will he order tests and do I have to take that out of my deductible? So I used to work for Blue Cross Blue Shield, the big insurance company here. And it's just the biggest scam because, you know, in Norway or Canada or wherever, you know, maybe there's not as much diagnostic te technology and whatever, but at least you can get your vitamin D tested, mm -hmm. you know, without worrying about it. So, you know, come on, US, go with it. <laughs> okay, so um, optimal levels of uh, vitamin D. I know there has been a couple of changes on what are considered... Uh, optimal levels. I don't know if um, everybody in the world have changed that, but I know in Norway they did a small change that even though you're still in the in the range, uh, you still might be vitamin D deficient. Yeah. So um, it all started in the mid 2000s when there were more and more vitamin D studies, and then towards the later 2000s. Um, is there a word for so like the the decades used to be the 80s and 90s. So I guess the, the the early the late 2000s before 2010, um, the Canadian and U.S. governments contracted the Institute of Medicine to look at all the research on vitamin D so that they could make a new optimal level. So um, the Institute of Medicine then hired some research institutions. So the one I was at did the systematic review for vitamin D. Um, for most of the outcomes for bone, you know, cardiovascular, some other stuff. So um, then the end result was that the recommended daily allowance went up to 400 um, IUs. And then what's trickier is the optimal range when you get tested. So the reason it's tricky is that the range is very broad and everybody is actually quite different as to what is optimal within there. Um, and so it's somewhat dependent on, you know, your ancestry and it's somewhat dependent on your disease state if you have any conditions. So in, in general, I'd say somewhere between 30 and 40 nanograms per milliliter, um, is usually a pretty good level for most people to have. So 
Um, that's another thing about the U.S. We use nanograms per milliliter, and literally everybody else in the world uses uh, uh, what is it, nanomoles per liter. Yeah. So uh, the conversion is something like 2.2 or 2.3. So 40 nanograms might be 90 or something. But um, you can get that 40 nanograms by supplementing uh, and getting vitamin D through the sun and producing about 4,000 IUs per day. Mm -hmm. So that's a combination of stuff, sun plus supplements plus food. Um, healthy men um, might need somewhere between two or 3,000 and 5,000 uh, IUs of vitamin D in the winter because in the winter, you're burning through the vitamin D that you stored up in the summer, presumably from sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, women often need a little bit less, but for all intents and purposes, let's just say it's the same. But the issue is that if you're sick or if you eat on a healthy diet, you might need more vitamin D than the next person. And this is where there's actually not a ton of research done. Um, so this is all just guesswork. So there's a couple nutrients, vitamin D and vitamin C, that if you're sick, you're stressed out, you just had your ACL repaired, you know, you're not getting a lot of sleep, you probably need more. So for vitamin C, um, all mammals synthesize vitamin D or vitamin C except for humans and like monkeys or ferrets or something. Yeah. So we need to eat vitamin C. And if you take in too much vitamin C, then you'll get diarrhea. But if you've taken a lot of vitamin C and you're really stressed, low sleep, you have a disease, you know, you just had surgery, you can take in a lot more vitamin C before you get diarrhea. And the reason is you're using more of that vitamin C. So vitamin C is not just an, an immune vitamin, it's also a stress vitamin. And vitamin D is similar. So vitamin D is a bone vitamin, an, an immune vitamin, potentially a cancer vitamin, and a heart vitamin, but it's also a stress vitamin. So if you're, you know, not not like, oh, I'm so stressed out today because of my first world problems. If you're stressed out legitimately, mm -hmm. then you might need more vitamin D. Another reason you might need more vitamin D is if you're not white. So um, it, it's hard to say if you're not white or not because not everybody has had a 23andMe test. And, you know, this isn't the main determinant of vitamin D. You know, everybody should get somewhere between 30 and 40 or be up to 30 or 40 nanograms per milliliter. But... If you want to fine tune it, um, the long and short of it is that uh, different cultures have different genetic adaptations to nutrients. So like for myself and for people from Northern Africa, for example, or from the Middle East, we have very uh, specific different um, ways of processing some vitamins and minerals um, and micronutrients. So uh, people who are very pale and light skinned you know, from Scandinavia originally, um, they will have eaten more animal products generally than people from near the equator. And people near the equator, because they ate more plants, got more long or, um, yeah, more plant sourced um, omega-3s, mm -hmm. so um, ALA. And because w there was more plant sourced ALA, we needed to convert more of it to longer chain EPA and DHA. So that's just an example. There is different conversion of fatty acids. But more and more researchers are finding out that vitamin D is also, our vitamin D levels are dictated by who our ancestors were. So if my ancestors ate more plant foods, then we didn't get as much vitamin D that was in the vitamin D3 form that people who ate a lot of seafood would, for example, um, or you know, took cod liver oil or whatever. So that means that uh, if you had a lower vitamin D intake and possibly also a lower calcium intake because of eating less animal products, then vitamin D and calcium are like peas in a pod. They go hand in hand. So if you both need to get more calcium into your bones and you need to boost up your active vitamin D level, then you will process vitamin D differently. And it turns out that people who aren't white usually need less vitamin D because they're a bit more naturally prone to convert the inactive vitamin D into that active form mm -hmm. and thereby get more calcium absorbed through our intestine and more calcium into our bone. So the thing is, this isn't something that you would know. This isn't really something you can test for. It's just something to keep in mind. So if you look at studies of African-American females, especially school-age children, 
they have lower levels of vitamin D than uh, school age white girls, but they don't have a higher risk of bone fracture and they have an equivalent or higher bone density. Mm -hmm. So having a bit lower vitamin D than somebody else doesn't mean it's bad. What really matters is bone density, um, some other indicators of health. So the range is wide for vitamin D, but it's justifiably wide. Um, but then if you Google vitamin D levels, there's going to be some confusion because there's the vitamin D council, which has a lot of good literature on vitamin D, but they possibly recommend a bit too high levels. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's the federal government, you know, so our report influenced the federal government to, you know, uh, change its recommendations for both intake and optimal levels. But the federal government wasn't just influenced by our systematic reviews. They're also influenced by different physicians and the basically dermatology lobby wants you to not have too high vitamin D levels because that means if you're trying to get very high vitamin D levels, you might be more prone to get skin cancer by getting too much sunlight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's some push and pull on this and it's very hard to say what the optimal level is, but 30, 35, possibly 40 is probably a pretty good level. Okay. And if, if you get tested, what, what levels... Um, what levels will, would indicate that you should uh, probably stop using vitamin D supplements if you are using that? What levels are things starting to get toxic? So um, one way of looking at it is because you're not going to know if things are toxic because like researchers barely know vitamin D toxicity based on case reports and you know some side effect uh, analyses. So one way to think about it is you probably shouldn't get more vitamin D in your blood than people who are outside all the time. So those people are lifeguards, uh, people who work on farms, people in uh, tribal villages who don't wear much clothing. So those people tend to have vitamin D at around like 45 nanograms per milliliter, possibly 50. Um, so you don't want to have higher than that mm -hmm. because then you're just playing with fire. Um, but then the other reason is there's an actual like side effect reason. So like just recently in our research digest, we covered an article about vitamin D and hypercalcemia. So vitamin D can help you get calcium into your bones and away from soft tissue, but it also somewhat requires vitamin K2 to do that. Hmm. So if you take a lot of vitamin D and you're not getting a healthy diet with some other nutrients, then you could get so much vitamin D that you're developing kidney stones or you're developing hypercalcemia. So, um, for example, lifeguards in Israel often get kidney stones and it's because they get so much vitamin D exposure and they get much more kidney stones than the typical person. Mm -hmm. um, and then outdoor workers in India, often in southern India, they get heart attacks a lot more than people who don't work outside. So there's a lot of confounders because people who work inside tend to be richer than people who work outside and they eat different diets. But um, humans are not really, you know, like I love the sun, but even I know that being outside in the sun every day is not really that healthy because humans don't have fur to protect them. Uh, you know, we synthesize vitamin D very easily and we get skin cancer pretty easily. So humans have always been outside some and been in shelter some. Mm -hmm. So get enough vitamin D that you're at or a bit below the level of people who are outside a lot which happens to be about 35, 40, uh, but don't play with fire and get 50, 60, 70. That being said, um, there are some people like, uh, there's a guy who wrote this book that's I think free on Amazon that has the longest title I've ever seen. It's like how I optimize my level of vitamin D and cure myself of all conditions within six months and you can do it too. And that's the title of the book. So that guy went up to, I don't know how much, like a hundred grand nanograms from a liter or I don't know what. So I don't recommend you go up to that level. It is though possible to go up to pretty high levels, 50, 60, 70, and still be healthy, except you have to have moderate levels of calcium and enough vitamin K2 and, and magnesium and some other stuff that works synergistically with these other nutrients. Because if you don't have that stuff, then vitamin D does convert to a hormone and it can wreak havoc. Excellent. Now let's get into more uh, sports related stuff. 
I know a lot of people on this channel are interested in things like body composition and, and performance. So is there any research that indicates that having optimal vitamin D levels can have positive effects on body composition and, and performance? So there's two lines of evidence. So the observational evidence for vitamin D and sports or body comp is better than the trial evidence. Mm -hmm. So observationally, more than half of athletes, so either recreational or pro or whatever, have low vitamin D levels. And by low, I mean below, let's say 30 mm -hmm. nanograms per milliliter. So for those people, supplementing is probably gonna help with performance for two different reasons. One reason is that if you're low in vitamin D, you're more likely to be sick and worn down. And if you're sick and worn down and depressed or whatever, then you're less likely to perform optimally. But the second is reasons actually related to performance, which is muscle and muscle re and uh, tissue remodeling. So it is possible that vitamin D um, can help in tissue remodeling and things like hormone optimization, but randomized trials are not so positive on this. So there are trials that show that endurance performance can be better if you supplement with vitamin D, power out could pot potentially be better, but the evidence is quite mixed about whether vitamin D supplementation can help with strength and greater muscle and with better body composition. So it's going to be probably five years before there's enough trials that we can look at this issue again and say that the evidence isn't mixed. But even then, I'd say it's hard to draw a conclusion because um, when you look at something like does vitamin D help sports or does vitamin D help weightlifting, then you have to look at more than one study because there's been more than one study and there's more than one type of you know sports. Mm -hmm. There's like, you know, I'm a bodybuilder, I'm a powerlifter, or I'm a rower, I'm a marathoner. Um, or I'm an elderly person just trying to optimize my muscle. So if you look at all those studies, you basically have to do a meta-analysis or a systematic review. Meta-analysis is the quantitative pooling of data. Systematic review is the thorough looking at all the studies um, in a systematic way. So the issue with that is that when you do a systematic review, so there was a great one done by um, Brad Dieter and Dylan Dahlquist um, on vitamin D and sports performance. Um, and Systematic reviews are great, but when you do a meta-analysis, I'm not sure if they did one, probably not, but um, the good part is that you do pull together all the studies, but the bad part is that you get one number, but that number can lose a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. You know, what's important in does vitamin D help sports performance and body comp is not what all the studies say, because it's like saying, oh, uh, if you look back at human history, are humans dumb or smart? Well, Okay, you could say overall no, or you could say overall yes, but what does that answer say? Nothing. Mm -hmm. You have to look at each specific decade or each specific war or whatever, and if you look at each specific study, you get granularity. So, um, you know, like Brad Dieter's uh, systematic review, um, I don't think it had a meta-analysis, but let's just say it did. There's even a level above meta-analysis, which is called umbrella review, and there was an umbrella review done a few years ago by the same guy who did the... 90% um, of medical findings are wrong study. Mm -hmm. um, and he used to work at our research center. He's a really smart Greek professor. Um, and that 90% that of medical findings uh, paper was super influential. But I think that the vitamin D umbrella review that he did is a bit misleading. Basically what it said is that vitamin D evidence is not as good as you would think. And uh, the evidence actually doesn't show that it has many benefits at all. Um, you know, including for sports performance, including for whatever, and that it does possibly help with bone fractures, but that's it. So I think that's flawed because when you're doing a meta-analysis, you're losing granularity of individual trials because patients are different, doses are different, there's just a background diets are different, sun exposure is different, genetics are different, so many things are different. But if you do a meta-analysis of meta-analyses, an umbrella review, you're not just losing the granularity of the trials, you're losing the granularity of the meta-analyses. So at that point, like, why are you even doing a meta-analysis of meta-analyses? Because it's not telling you much. Mm -hmm. So if you say, oh, vitamin D isn't shown to help cancer, that doesn't mean anything because A, no nutrient is really going to be shown to help cancer because cancer is slow developing. Mm -hmm. So you would have to have a trial over like 10 or 15 years 
to show any effect. And there's going to be a total of like two trials that are that long because they cost, you know, tens of millions of dollars. Um, and second is that, you know, vitamin D is important. But like I said, vitamin D in isolation supplementation doesn't mean that much. Vitamin D supplemented with vitamin uh, K2, with magnesium, with optimal levels of calcium, that trial could show you if vitamin D really helps sports performance or cancer. So nutrition is much more complicated than even like a nutrition researcher would know. You really have to be somebody who researches nutrition research to know what what the studies can tell you. And what I would say is that don't look at the studies directly and rely on those for vitamin D and performance. Look at those, but also think about vitamin D in general. Uh, knowing that over half of athletes are deficient in vitamin D and knowing that vitamin D helps, helps immune health and thinking back to when you've made gains or not made gains in the gym, you know, was it when you were taking some random supplement or was it when you were feeling good? You know, when you were getting enough food, when you weren't getting cold all the time, mm -hmm. um, it's probably the latter. So that means you have to have sufficient levels of vitamin D because it's the central nutrient for feeling good, um, not just for, uh, you know, immune health and for not being sick, but there was just a trial showing that vitamin D helps major depression. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily like, you know, minor depression or whatever it's called or episodes of depression, but people who are so depressed that it's either you know, get electroconvulsive therapy or, you know, there's not many options. So vitamin D helps that, you know, that it's important for other stuff. So yeah, I would say vitamin D is important for performance and body comp, even if it's not fully fleshed out in the literature yet. Excellent. I know that it's been a, a, a focus in the sports nutrition world to get athletes to have sufficient vitamin D levels based on what you just said, that a lot of athletes are uh, deficient. But at some point, it seems that some athletes took it a bit further uh, because yeah. they were told that vitamin D, having optimal vitamin D levels is good. So the first thought they thought was, if this is good, more uh, needs to be better. And I remember I was at the... ISEN conference in Newcastle last year, uh, Professor Kloss did an uh, excellent uh, talk on uh, vitamin D in athletes. And I think he mentioned that you should probably not go above um, 100 nanomoles per liter. That was his, okay. uh, his uh, recommendation. And I think it was optimally it should be between 75 and 100. That was the optimal range that he mentioned during his, uh, during his talk. Yeah, so it makes sense because not just other health stuff, but we don't actually know what high vitamin D levels does in muscle. Mm -hmm. So the studies that have been done on muscle, you know, other than like give give a population 400 IUs of vitamin D and see if they perform better, the actual muscle studies have looked at what happens when you subject muscle cells directly to vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And we don't know yet if very high vitamin D might suppress part of the muscle repair process. And this is analogous to like 20 years ago, we didn't know if vitamin C and E suppressed um, recovery from a bout of exercise. So right now we don't know if vitamin D does. The difference is that vitamin C, you know, you pee it out. So if you suppressed your recovery from a week's worth of workouts, who cares? Mm -hmm. But if your vitamin D levels are super high because you know more is better and you're not making gains, it's very slightly possible it's because um, you know your muscle genes are not expressing their whatever needs to be expressed in order to repair the muscle. We just don't know yet. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, another thing that I know uh, people are interested in is vitamin D and, and testosterone levels because there was a study a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2011, uh, Pills and colleagues did a study on mm -hmm. testosterone and vitamin D. And they basically took some overweight people, uh, divided them into two groups. And I think the dosage was uh, 83 micrograms per day for a whole year. Mm -hmm. And combined with exercise, I have to mention also that all of the participants in the study were vitamin D deficient. And the difference was that the participants that took vitamin D, they increased their testosterone levels by 25%, I think it was. And I remember just the supplement industry, they just took that study and, and ran with it. 
every pre-workout, no, every um, testosterone booster and every supplement that came out, they added uh, vitamin uh, D in it. So what does the research actually say on on uh, vitamin D and, and testosterone? So um, like you said, if you give vitamin D to a athletic population, then a lot of them are going to be low in vitamin D. And then um, vitamin D did help testosterone production. But again, it's hugely misleading and it's just like fish oil. Mm -hmm. So the reason why fish oil systematic reviews and meta-analyses are misleading is because if you give fish oil to somebody who eats a crappy diet, it can make some intermediate outcomes better. Athletic performance, heart health, whatever. Mm -hmm. If you give vitamin D to people who are vitamin D deficient, the end result of vitamin D is... uh, hormone it's called a secosteroid it's a steroid where one of the one of the chains is broken so hormones work together and vitamin d um does work with other anabolic hormones so yes you need vitamin d in order to have pretty good testosterone levels but more vitamin d is absolutely not better for testosterone um and in fact we try to regulate our vitamin d in our cells so much that we have an additional form of vitamin D, that calcitriol. So if you start overloading yourself with vitamin D, then what happens is uh, it's a fat soluble vitamin. So you start storing it in your fat and then kind of all bets are off. So in the extreme case, if uh, you're either obese or if you're a bodybuilder and you're bulking and cutting, then, you know, you start losing weight, fat gets burned. What else is in the fat? The vitamin D. And then the vitamin D gets released and suddenly you've got high levels of vitamin D in your blood more so than your body wants. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? You have too much calcitriol. So you want to avoid that as much as possible. You don't want to store much vitamin D, you know, unless the world is ending and we're getting a nuclear winter and you have to store it. There's absolutely no reason to store too much vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that if your vitamin D gets very high, unknown things will start happening like you don't recover and maybe part of that is due to lower testosterone it's really at this point who knows Mm -hmm. excellent now let's wrap this um, wrap this podcast up what would your recommendation to ensure sufficient vitamin d intake be so um i'd say there's two steps three steps go to your primary care physician get your vitamin d tested if it's in the teens uh, nanograms per milliliter, then take vitamin D supplement. If it's above the teens, 20 or greater, it's optional. You can take a supplement, you can get more sunlight, you could even, you know, take cod liver oil or eat more seafood. Um, then start getting your vitamin D up and get retested in a few months. And if you're at 30, 35, great. If you're at 40, again, great. 42, 43, good. If you're at 45, it's okay, but then if you start feeling different or if, you know, because research doesn't know everything about vitamin D, especially side effects, you have to listen to your body. So if you're at 45, if you're at 50, if you're at 55, 60, 70, then pay attention to your body and have a specific reason why you wanna go that high in vitamin D. If you read some paper that showed that high levels are medicinal for some reason, you know, I haven't read every paper, if you happen to read one, then make sure you get there safely. So to get there safely, the synergistic nutrients are calcium in a moderate amount, vitamin K2 in a large amount, and uh, zinc and magnesium. You have to make sure that those are plentiful, and if not, vitamin D could be harmful. So once you reach that 30, 40, then maintain it. Um, supplement with 1,000 IUs or 2,000 IUs or you know whatever you need to maintain it, and uh, not everybody knows how much of a supplement they need to get to a certain amount because everybody's vitamin D metabolism is different. So for example, I first got my vitamin D tested something like 15 years ago and I was at 17 nanograms per milliliter and I, I was already in the nutrition field at that time and I took a multivitamin and I was like, what the hell is going on? Like, is everything I knew wrong about nutrition? But I don't know why. I don't know why my vitamin D metabolism is different than somebody else's. So vitamin D metabolism and synthesis through sunlight differs depending on the person, which really, really means you have to get tested. Um, And then the last caveat is that if you're light-skinned or pale, 
err on the side of supplementation just in case of skin cancer. If you know a lot about skin cancer, if you know your history, if you've gotten a mole removed or whatever, if you know how much vitamin or sunlight exposure you need to get vitamin D without causing any issues, sunlight is fine. But I know some people who are essentially allergic to the sun. Supplements are a safe way to get vitamin D then. Excellent. All right, Kamal, thank you so much for uh, doing this great uh, podcast. Where can people find more information about you? Um, so I'm at examine.com. Um, you can contact me there or on Facebook. We're there. I'm there at facebook.com slash Miranda July. Um, it's a long story, but that's my Facebook address. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, contact me on Facebook. I, I read every message and respond. Or if you contact examine.com, I read all the emails. So um, we like talking to people who are enthusiastic about their health and we're curious because we're basically just curious people who do it as a job. So let us know. Excellent, Kamal. Once again, thank you so much, Kamal, and uh, have a nice day. It's my pleasure.